Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. So I'm going to kick things off today. My name is Gene Quinn. I'm a co-founder and a volunteer of Travel Scrum. And I'm here with my colleagues today, Florian Mesny, co-founder and uh, volunteer, and also our hackathon organizer, as well as Salani Bajaj, who is the virtual COO of an enterprise of more than 30 volunteers, more than 50 mentors, and almost as many judges for all of the work that all of you have showed up to produce over the next four days. We're thrilled to be here. I'm in suburban Metro New York. Florian is in Montreal and Salani is in Singapore. They'll join us in a, a few minutes with their own stories and their own roles here. But I wanted to explain a bit about Travel Scrum and I'll do it on a very personal level. I'm holding in my hand a piece of volcanic glass that I picked up in the Yellowstone National Park caldera uh, at one of the treasures of not only the United States, but the world. Uh, a, a, one, of the, one of the principal destinations of visitors from America and from the world, and that's Yellowstone National Park. I'm also holding in my hand a rock from the beach at Omaha um, in Normandy a beach where my own father came ashore several weeks after D-Day and fought his way across Europe uh, in 1945. <clears throat> These are the sorts of talisman that I carry in my memory of places that I've traveled. And there's a couple others that I wanted to share with you. Here is a actual bronze medal from the 1988 Calgary Winter Olympics. You'll all remember it as the Jamaican bobsled team and Cool Runnings, the film. And Eddie the Eagle, who left the pub in the UK and skied down the ski jump hill with everyone's heart in their throats while he landed. Last, I'd like to share this talisman with you. It is the quill of a hedgehog that I picked up at Lawande National Park in Malawi. Right after my family was presented with this piece of folk art with the words Chalo Chiweme, which roughly translated in the uh, native, um, uh, native language of, of Malawi, uh, Chitimbuka, which is a derivative of the Chichewa co-national language of Malawi, the other which is English. Um, these items represent a very personal journey that my family and I had to Malawi to build a school as my son was concluding his second year of, in the US Peace Corps as a counselor uh, in Echo Forestry. And these are the things that we're all missing right now. You have your own rock. You have your own piece of folk art. You have your own memories. So what's in, inspired us to create an opportunity for all of us to be done grieving, be done with the pandemic, uh, shut down in our creative spirits and create um, what travel will look like to each and all of us from our own perspective through a hackathon. We formed a not-for-profit corporation along with Florian and Sean Arena, longtime Sabre colleague of mine in, in business and now CEO of Limo Anywhere, a startup based in Dallas that has gone through some of his own challenges running an operating business while starting a not-for-profit movement like this. So Travel Scrum was formed as a not-for-profit company uh, to educate, inform, and build skills in the workers and businesses post-pandemic. Much of the world's travel uh, worker force is uh, locked up and shut out of what they love to do and love to work at. And we're gonna to hear today from Florian and Solani about the first tenet of a strategy that Travel Scrum created less than three months ago called Ready, Fire, Aim. And the fire part is happening these four days where all of you will contribute 
to some very valuable solutions to be considered after the pandemic lets us travel again. So I'm very proud to be part of this team and I'm only a part of this team. The team is, has brought us to this point and you all are joining this team today by signing up for this hackathon, submitting your ideas and hopefully joining us over the next many months as we slog our way through this time and perhaps see some of these ideas funded and come to fruition so that we all can use them on our first journey away from the pandemic and into memories like I'm able to hold in my hand and all of you are able to hold in your hand. So with that, let me introduce you to Florian Manny, who is my longtime friend and longtime partner in many pursuits. So Florian, over to you. Thank you, Thank Gina. You, Gina. Uh, it's a great pleasure, great pleasure. To all, and thanks for that introduction. You were speaking about uh, talisman. Uh, the current talisman for me is this one. Say, so how can we, will we be able to travel again normally and not uh, travel with this uh, constantly or a mask? Uh, I mean, it all started, so here it's a bit of a personal chat before we go into the details and, uh, and I will leave also as well Saloni give her personal intake and, uh, and uh, how it came about uh, with her. Uh, clearly when the, when the pandemic struck, everyone, uh, everyone started uh, being, uh, did not understand what was happening and no one had answers for at least uh, the first months, no one had really answers. And speaking around the world uh, with a lot of people from the industry, it's like everything was going down and it was very complicated. And, uh, and uh, clearly yeah, when, we, uh, when I contacted immediately with Gene saying uh, we need to do something, uh, I would like to organize a hackathon. Uh, there's plenty of things being done currently for in terms of emergency and uh, health issues, but we need to do something bigger related uh, uh, to the travel industry. It's slightly different, it's global, and it's going to take a long time. And, um, and Jean, very fast, uh, speaking with Sean as well, because we had worked all of us together in organizing in the various hackathons in the past. Uh, we came about, about uh, with the fact of, our, of creating uh, a non-profit organization and uh, in fact it was not about creating one event it was about creating a movement and we started speaking around uh, would people be willing uh, to uh, to go into such a movement or to believe in such a, uh, an event first as a first step and the positive and uh, the answers have been uh, highly positive and in fact uh, we started uh, I'd say uh, one month and a half ago, a bit less than, well, a bit more than one month and a half ago, uh, with me and Saloni, which we were presented uh, in Singapore. I say, okay, <laughs> blank sheet of paper, what do we do and how do we do it? And uh, it's uh, first organizing something now, but we need to look at the long term. And, uh, and since then, it's been amazing. And we're going to present you later on a bit uh, the teams and uh, the people who have joined, but we have huge amount of volunteers having joined, believing in the project and giving time like I've never seen before and, uh, and love to travel. Uh, mentors joining as well and saying, okay, let's do it. Uh, we are under pressure as well on our side with businesses, but if we can help people provide solutions which will benefit the all, to all, let's do it. And we've done some onboarding calls this week with mentors, which were amazing. and. Uh, we have more than 80 mentors around the world uh, in a, the ready uh, fire A mentality to give uh, to give quality to you. And uh, we have amazing supporters as well, uh, which we will present to you afterwards and some uh, technological providers which are willing to help you as well during uh, this hackathon. So Travel Scrum is about uh, giving back. It's about uh, being creative. It's about the travel and tourism industry as a global. And it's about a movement, and we thank you for being here. And uh, we hope that these four days will be uh, your days uh, to uh, to make an impact as well. So, in fact, we're giving you uh, we're giving you the, the floor to make things happen. So, thank you for that. And Saloni, uh, in one month and a half, I've been more than thrilled knowing you, working with you, and uh, and I'm giving you the floor because. Uh, if uh, this is happening, it's uh, thanks to you and uh, you are an amazing woman. Thank you very much. And 
Hi, Salami. Hello, Salami. Hi. Okay. Hello. Go ahead, Salami. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jean, and thank you, Florian, for the absolutely brilliant introduction and such kind words. I did not have anything to show, just like Jean and Florian. So I looked around in the room and I found this artifact, which is a Spanish bull. And the reason I show this is because I want to power through this situation. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. So guys, you didn't like you didn't give me the brief before. Anyway, so how I came to meet Jean and Florian is I spoke to Jean um, almost two months back where I got introduced to him by a common connect. And she told me that, why don't you talk to Jean? He's working around and figuring out what can be the next over the pandemic. We had a late evening call for me, early morning call for Jean. And I remember what we spoke about. We spoke about Jean's love for coffee, my dislike for it, and Jean's vision for the industry. I remember him mentioning that over his career of, I would say almost 40 years, how he has seen so many ups and downs in the industry and how after every crisis, the industry has just come out to be much more stronger. And what his thought was that this is our time to band together, to get together all the doers and the dreamers of the industry and everybody who wants to travel again under one umbrella to give back to the community. Because now was not the time to think about which industry we come from, which sector we come from. It was really the time to think about the future. It was really the time to enable everybody to travel again. And that kind of resonated with me because for two reasons. One, because I am from the industry and I could see everybody around me just talking about how airlines are going bankrupt, how they have to close their offices, how people are losing jobs. And it was it was really sad. I wanted to give back and also because I wanted to travel again. I, I wanted to see all those places again. I wanted to go and try the food. I just didn't want to cook in my kitchen the cakes and do the check, do the check mark of what I'm doing in the lockdown. But I wanted to go back to those places. So I thought this is my time to contribute as well, to be a doer and a dreamer of this industry and band together. So that's where it all came along with me. I love Jean's vision and that's how I became a part of Travel Scrum. I next spoke to Floria, who apart from the vision had a lot of documents to give me. So I remember with him, my first call was, he said, yes, we have Travel Scrum and we have a hackathon schedule in the next one month. These are the documents, go through them, and we have to create a dev post page, we have to create our guidelines, we have to learn Slack, we have to create visuals. I was lost. And between time zones and the lack of skills between Florian and me, I didn't know where would we go from here. Because none of us knew how to design a website, none of us knew how to go to social media. So yes, pretty lost. And that is where we wanted to reach out to the larger community. And that's where it all began, I would say. And not everybody can be over here today, but if we could just bring that slide up, which has got the faces of the team. We have around 35 people from across geographies. Initially, we had a couple of them. So I remember speaking to a friend, Shiksha, who's now a volunteer. We had Augustine, Antoine doing a couple of things, but we needed a lot more people. And it's a special thank you to everybody in the team, everybody in the scrum who has helped bring this all together. It was absolutely not possible without everybody being there all the time and bringing in the energy which they brought with them. We have these daily check-ins, which I want to talk about. So it's it's late in the evening for me. It's really early in the morning for Florian and Jean. And for people across the globe, the times are really different and off. But no one ever misses a call. And in the call, everybody has so much energy. It's infectious. And that is what has brought us to this stage today. So a very big round of applause for the team. And thank you, everybody, for being there. The other set of people I want to thank are our participants. 
when we went live on death post we didn't know how the whole death post thing works we didn't know how many participants we'll have because at that point we were not even giving out any prizes our whole idea was we give to the industry and as we go along if we get some people to band along we it will be a good to have but the purpose really was to come up with productive implementable solutions we went live on death post and the amazing thing is a lot of people signed up and people joined slack and i cannot show my screen right now but the activity on slack is absolutely amazing so thank you and thank you for joining all our live sessions so we are really really excited to have all of you on board we have around we have around 400 participants who have signed up and we have also have around 50 idea submissions we are expecting a lot more to come our way so all the best and people who have not signed up yet please sign up you have till midnight utc to do that and band along and come up with all your ideas thank you salani thank you thank you salani uh so volunteers participants uh, we are all uh, blessed but uh, by the fact you are here i would like to speak slightly and quickly about the mentors uh, so i have a small uh, so I, as i mentioned we have around 80 mentors around the world and in fact you need to understand that we have had more than 150 requests from different mentors and we still have requests from people willing to help during the hack unfortunately we had to stop uh, the registrations because uh, we did not want to have 10 mentors per team or else it would be difficult to manage uh, so for the teams you will have certainly two mentors uh, and uh, they are going to give and you will need to organize yourself with them most of the other mentors who have not been able to make it we have asked them to also to do videos in order to explain uh, their expertise and to give you insights regarding uh, their um, regarding the challenges how they perceive the challenges and what they would like to see created by yourself so in fact all these videos and content you as participants you need to use them look into them so it's in our youtube channel and there's plenty of more being updated uh, today we have like more than 20 who are going to be added today and more during the hack as well uh and you need to look at them because it might give you some insight and good ideas and clarification on some things you might want to do so it's uh something being given by the mentors by the professionals in the industry uh, have fun with it take what you can it's your choice and be creative afterwards so the mentors thank you very much for that and we look forward to having your contribution uh, during this weekend uh, and uh, and we make we can be sure that we are here to answer all your question and all your doubts jean go ahead well where are we are in the order here we want to talk a little bit about uh, the apis and the technical providers as well yes so here you can look at the it's on the screen So we have we have many folks to thank here at the sponsor, mentor, and uh, API level. Um, we have, um, you know, the, the one thing I'll I'll say not just about this list, other than a gigantic thank you to each and every one of uh, of these companies, uh, but to the uh, to the uh, participant hackers and designers, um, you should be living on Slack every day for some part of your day. As you interact with these APIs, the support that they're providing, and the mentorship that uh, both the volunteer Scrum crew at uh, Travel Scrum and the uh, subject matter expert mentors uh, that we've paired you up with, use that Slack connection uh, to basically get most of your in-moment questions at least asked, and uh, in in some efficient asynchronous manner the mentors and the team here will use slack to get back with you many of you have slack in your culture anyway so this is easy to understand but those of you who don't just bear up be patient like me i wasn't born with slack i'm too old to, 
to be in that kind of connected economy, but I'm connected now and it, and I keep up every day. So um, that's the primary mechanism to learn more about these companies. Thanks. So these are the, the, uh, the uh, technical APIs that you'll be able to, uh, the, to use during the hack. If you want, use them and they are here to help and there's uh, support for you. If you want to bring in uh, other technologies, other hacks, other ways of looking, you're more than happy to do so. It's not an obligation to use them. They are here and it's easier for them eventually to, uh, to have access. So it's the, the beauty of it. Regarding the hackathon, we have six awards to give you to, uh, to, uh, um, to recompensate uh, this, uh, for this hackathon. One global winner, three best regional teams from EMEA, APAC, and Americas, one People's Choice Awards, which uh, the, only the participants will be able to vote for, and one best design team, okay? So we're looking for projects which can be viable and implementable, okay, in the midterm, and the judges will look into that so that it can really bring to the uh, community. The winners of the global award will need to be uh, technic uh, technically related. We need to see uh, some development. Technically. We are accepting, if you don't have any technical skills, we are accepting as well uh, business models and processes if you provide an amazing mock-up in order to show how things are going to happen in place. But the amazing mock-up will not be able to compete for the global award. You will be able to compete for all the other awards and specifically, specifically the best design team. I want to make things clear. The global winner will need to tackle one of the challenges, one or more of the challenges, and bring technicality and development into the game. Uh, to, uh, to reward this award, we have the opportunity, we have the chance of having amazing sponsors and supporters who have joined us in the movement. And uh, we have uh, more than 10, uh, 10 supporters uh, having joined. Some of them are giving us amazing prizes. And for example, we have Agoranex, uh, Hub, Sustainable Hub in Tulum who is giving away a full week of acceleration for 10 teams, 10 winners, uh, and for uh, a full week in September in Mexico with uh, Demo Day in the end, and all is inclusive except the flight. So uh, that's one of the prizes and it's quite nice and it's related to sustainable tourism and it's the launch of the first sustainable hub and incubator. So thank you guys for, for giving us that, that opportunity. We have as well AWS, Amazon giving us uh, uh, credits to all the winners so that you can keep on building your, uh, your, uh, your project online thanks to their solutions and their cloud solutions. And we have Glider, which is a project management company giving us as well uh, annual fees uh, for you to be able to create, build up upon your team, your processes, and operation. So everything is is related to helping you go from the prototype your, and the idea you're going to put together today towards an MVP and a viable product. All the other sponsors are amazing and are going to give advisory, mentoring, and we have some perks as well which are being uh, which are being offered. And you can go and see them in the uh, Hackathon 2020 page. Uh, Travel Scrum page, website, or the DevPost website, and you have a bit of the details there. So that's uh, that's for me uh, regarding the, the specifics of the supporters and uh, the sponsors which are helping us. Next word, maybe Jean, you want to tell about the specific uh, goodies? Surprise, last minute surprise. Because you, you broke up for a moment. No, that's fine. Go ahead, Jean, if you want to, because we have some last minute uh, goodies and surprises. So if you want to uh, to give an insight on the on what can be uh, offered and uh, proposed to the to the participants, to the hackers. Well, we 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 will be passing out to all participants um, 
$150 in AWS credits, which you can use for one month. Uh, you, can, uh, you can use those um, following the hack, um, and, and we will be in touch with you during the hack about how to do that. Um, and uh, a little more detail, uh, if I may, about the Glider Prize. Um, the uh, uh, six winners will be getting a one-year subscription, which costs $50 per seat. Um, and all of the members of those teams will be signed up for a one-year subscription. It is based on the Lean Startup Project Management and customer discovery learnings that the Glider team um, uh, absorbed from a, a, a program taught in the Cal Berkeley MBA program. And it has changed the face of how very young companies can get a head start beyond their minimum viable prototype in a hack to quickly cycle through how you can take that product to seed stage funding and even to market. So it's a very powerful tool. So between those um, types of access that you'll be able to get as winners of the, the large uh, Amazon uh, Web Services prize of uh, cloud, uh, cloud storage and tools, uh, you'll actually have project management uh, advantages with that tool. Excellent. So uh, we are going to, uh, so I'm going to explain what is coming next. First, I just say the hack is launched. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to the Scrum. Uh, afterwards, uh, that's my, that, these are going to be my last words, even though you're going to see me right after, because we have two panels coming up. Uh, the two panels are going to give you, uh, or meant, to give you insights, we're bringing people who are going to give you uh, views from the travel industry with numbers and uh, applicable uh, insights uh, that you could tackle immediately uh, within your hackathon. So uh, bear, with, bear with us, stay tuned. There will be two panels. And my last words, thank you for joining the Scrum. And I leave the last words to, uh, to uh, Saloni and to Jim as well. Well, Sal Saloni is off uh, managing the Scrum right now. So um, I will stand in for her and say this. Um, I want to give just a short uh, shout out to the three challenges. Uh, one of the central parts of organizing this hackathon was what shut travel down, and that was the pandemic. So the first of three challenges uh, is health and hygiene. What are the public health challenges and how can travel tech solve that as we get back in, as, as free people moving freely? The second one is around experiences. Experiences we all know as the reason why you travel and what you do. There's been a lot of publicity around that before the pandemic about large infusions of cash in the experience industries. Uh, we have many different global providers of aggregated experiences and local providers of tours and activities of what people do on holiday. All of that will change for a variety of reasons, health reasons, economic reasons, time. So how can you look at why we go traveling on business or pleasure or a blend called leisure and invent some new type of experience post pandemic that can, um, not replace, but enhance the way we thought of it just a few short months ago. And the final challenge is relief for the industry with sustainable business development. And by that, we mean plenty of people are out of work. And if you can address job referral, job networking, new ways to learn basic skills about the travel industry, to not only students coming into the market in panic about not starting their career, uh, you have a lot of panic in people who had their careers interrupted. So your creative ideas around how to relieve the pressure of the lack of jobs there and uh, replace it with opportunities and advantages they can make for themselves by skills enhancement is the third challenge. 
that is uh, uh, quite motivational in my mind, uh, given the way I opened up the, the commentary here today. I'm missing travel, and I want to learn how to do things safely, professionally, and more economically to jump back into it with the baby steps we think are coming and uh, ultimately return to what travel was before the pandemic when we learn how to deal uh, with the situations that it has confronted us with. So with that, I hope you're charged up to start working on your projects and we'll meet you on Slack and we'll see you throughout uh, the tournament and gather again at the end to present all of your great ideas to judges. Thank you very much. Thanks to Florian. Thanks to Solani. Thanks to our crew that produced this and all of our volunteers and to you for joining us. Good luck and scrum on. So don't leave. Now we're going to start. Uh, Saloni, do you want to give a last word uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding the, the Yes, day? I'll do that. I think I feel like the rule lady now, but I'll just mention, and we are getting a lot of comments over here, so I'll clarify a couple of things. You can still submit your ideas till midnight UTC. If you have any more questions regarding APIs, I can see questions regarding how to form our team, regarding credits, please contact us on Slack. And we'll be sharing all the details at the end of the closing ceremony. Mentors will be assigned later. And as Jean said, scrum on, let's hack, and let's bring the best solutions ahead. All the best, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We'll so see you in the now, next session. Stay connected, because I'm, we're going now to, uh, to advance and uh, do a, uh, start with the first panel. And after the first panel, we will do a 10 or 15 minute break. And, uh, and we will have some closing words uh, at the end. Uh, so I'm delighted to, uh, to lead and moderate this first panel. And um, I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome uh, Olga Gomez Garcia. Uh, hello, Olga. Ah, you're on mute. Yes, here we go. How are you okay. doing? Hello. Fine, fine, fine. It's great. Uh, to have you here, and so uh, with Olga, we will uh, we will look at uh, the industry overview uh, from a, a public institutional and economical point of view, for you to understand what is the real impact currently in the world and why it's important to uh, to have the, the uh, travel industry back on track, because in fact uh, well, I would say uh, yeah, if there's no travel industry, uh, the global economy. Uh, has a, will have a lot of difficulties. So Olga will give us a lot of insights. So to start with Olga, thank you for, uh, for being with us today. Uh, thank you, you very have, much for having me, it's a pleasure. You're welcome. Uh, you have been working for quite a while in the tourism sector, uh, but nowadays you work at the Inter-American Development Bank in uh, tourism related matters. Can you please explain us a little bit about the IDB and your role? Sure. Well, thank you, Florian, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, congrats for this incredible effort that is so much needed and for your leadership, the leadership of your partners and all the team. Uh, I think this uh, hackathon, I think it can contribute greatly to, to the recovery, hopefully, and uh, it's, it's really, as I said, very much needed. So. Regarding the IDB and what we do, we basically, our goal is to improve lives in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, we do that through financial and technical support for countries. So we try and we aim to reduce poverty and inequality and to promote sustainable growth. Um, uh, we have 48 member countries, uh, 26 of them are, are borrowing, what we call borrowing member countries. So they are the, the beneficiaries and that they are the ones that can benefit from this financial and technical support. And we work in uh, very different domains. We have experts from health, public health, education, climate change, and as well the tourism sector. And I'm currently working as an operational lead specialist at the IDB in the tourism sector. So we basically, we have uh, two uh, big, it's a big group, a big institution, and there is a part of us who work with the public sector, and there is another, uh, uh, part of our institution, IDB Invest, who works with the private sector. 
So I hope that summarizes a little bit what we do. That's good, but it's amazing because it means uh, what you said, it's tackling, uh, the coincidence is that it's tackling uh, all three challenges that we're looking into for the hack. So uh, we're there and uh, thank you for now giving us a bit more details. Uh, my second question is that uh, we are aware that the tourism sector is currently facing an uh, unpre unprecedented uh, challenge. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the impact the COVID pandemic is having on the tourism sector worldwide and particularly on emerging countries? Uh, well, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. So I'm going to share some numbers. Uh, I'm trying to, to share my screen. I don't know if you guys can see it or the tech team can help me. Here we go. So yes, basically, I think it's, it's good if we uh, start by the starting point. Where, where where are we standing? And I think it's very important to say that this is an unprecedented challenge, as you, as you put it, and as well that it was a sector that has been growing uh, for over a decade at a very uh, rapid uh, pace and even more than the general economy, substantially more than the general economy. It has an amazing contributor to the job and employment creation of entrepreneurship opportunities all around the different quintiles of uh, of uh, uh, rent and uh, income, sorry. And uh, what we see here is that we were about nearly nine trillion of contribution to the world GDP. That means one out of ten dollars if we take into account direct, indirect, and induced uh, effects. And that's is it's really, really big. We we should uh, take into account those numbers and then take a look to employment. So we are talking here about three hundred. 30 million jobs, one out of 10 worldwide. All this is uh, data from uh, WTTC, the World Travel and Tourism Council, 2019 data. So just before the pandemic really hit around the world. And one of the key questions here is uh, to highlight is that we have over the last five years, one out of four jobs, according to their research, have been created directly or indirectly by the tourism sector. Um, one thing that sometimes uh, non-tourism experts forget is that this is an export sector. It's the third worldwide category in terms of exports, and it, it accounts nearly for 30% of exports worldwide, uh, nearly 7% worldwide uh, in total exports, and it's a main source of investment in many countries. And I think this is very important to say that it's uh, fundamental in developed countries, but as well, it has been key for many emerging economies. And I think uh, it has been a driver for trying to reduce poverty and inequality as, um, as it provides opportunities all around the spectrum of educational levels, all around the spectrum of different uh, population segments that might have more or less opportunities to access to education or other resources. Uh, we see significant differences regionally in terms of the contribution of the tourism sector, but what we can clearly see is that it's very important all across the regions, most regions, and crucial for many. So I think that kind of summarizes a little bit um, those numbers, and um, I think it uh, hopefully uh, explains about the importance. In terms of the impact, which I think is a key question here, yep. uh, I think this graph is a little depressing to be honest, but I hope we will recover. I don't know if soon, but uh, we are not, uh, as um, Saloni was putting in, this is, has been devastated for many livelihoods and we really have to all work together and try to be a uh, part of the recovery effort and reopening this uh, important uh, sector that has created so many opportunities for many. When we compare it, we, at the very beginning of the crisis, we were trying to see how does this compare to other crises that we have faced? And the answer plainly is it does not compare. I think in my opinion, you can see this graph, I think summarizes very well. Uh, when we face like the SARS epidemic, uh, we barely were there. There were not such an important and on so substantial decrease in international tourist arrivals. We see 9-11 that everyone was talking at the very beginning in, in the, with doing a parallelism in terms of closing borders. But what is key here is that tourism, as um, Jen was saying before, I mean, this is a social activity. It has the characteristics. So all sectors have been affected, but tourism is social in, uh, in the very essence of tourism is social activity. The demand, which is 
people uh, goes to where the supply is. So that means movement. So all the, the, the policy measures related to try to stop this pandemic have affected substantially uh, to the sector. And I think it's probably the sector that has been the most affected, travel and tourism. And just to put some numbers there uh, to close this, this, um, this um, point of our discussion, we see here that currently uh, United, uh, the World Tourism Organization is expecting that this year for 2020, the decline in international tourism arrivals will be around between 60 and 80%, depending on the evolution of the pandemic and the policy related measures, is nearly more or less under those uh, percentage relative terms in terms of uh, contribution, economic contribution. Um, and uh, as well, we have new appealing numbers that were published yesterday while the WTTC in terms of jobs and uh, is nearly 200 million jobs at risk. I think this is uh, really unprecedented in only related to our uh, economic activity, previous numbers were around uh, 100 million. So I think this is very important that we try to get some specific uh, initiatives for this sector and for their, its recovery. Excellent. Can I, can I ask you a small question? I think uh, we, uh, we clearly understand the magnitude of the impact and it's, uh, and it's impressive. I mean, we tend to look at it from the customer, uh, consumer and customer perspective, but we, uh, we tend to forget the real impact it has. On the, on the economies, on countries, and on businesses, uh, and on the lives of people uh, in the back end, and what impacts it will have in the in the long term. So, um, how do you think we can contribute with this hackathon uh, to the recovery of the tourism sector? I think we have uh, different uh, ways. I think this ha hackathon is going to be very, very important. It, it, uh, the ideas that might come is as a first step and many others. This is going to be a, tourism is facing uh, a structure and challenge. So it's going to be changed considerably from we are going to the way we operated, the way business operated, the, the way that we predicted when we were talking about revenue management, no? all the different mechanisms that we have in order to manage our operations, the capacity is going to change. We are talking now about how bioprotocols are, are, are going to be uh, implemented in order to reassure the demand, but as well how that could affect the experience, as Jen was saying before. So... And in any scenario, all, all the way that we see in terms of new trends on capture the new trends of the demand, uh, trying to tackle from the supply side how we are going to provide more specific products that are going to be really targeted to the needs, uh, desires, and demands of, of, the, of the new demand segments, uh, how we can create contactless solutions that will prevent uh, and that will contribute to stop the spread of any type of uh, pathogen and, and, and the virus and stop the pandemic and reassure the traveler in their traveling experience. From how we manage destinations in a more uh, uh, market intelligence way, in a more uh, technological way that we can in, in gather and analyze that data um, in, in, with a, another type of scope. Uh, from uh, any sorts of solution, Every expert is saying it will come to um, it has something in common that is innovation, technology. We really need, and this is very important that we have to make it accessible because otherwise what is going to happen is that those countries' destination that have their resources, and when I say resources, it's not only financial resources, but as well technical knowledge resources, the human capital to develop this solution, to implement it mainly, and as well in terms of the, when we take it to the corporation level and to the business level, uh, are going to thrive. When you speak of the countries, you speak about countries which are, which are having like 40% or 50% of their GDP uh, related to travel and tourism. Yeah, there are countries where that are, there are emerging countries that they have a very substantial part of the GDP and exports and employment that are completely dependent on the, on the, on the tourism sector. And we have to make sure at a country level, at a destination level, but as well all through the value chains, that those technologies and those solutions that we are trying to create, design and implement uh, will have the characteristics that will make them accessible to everyone, to every destination and accessible not only in terms of the cost, but as well in terms of the capabilities that they require to be operated. Okay. 
what, what, what do you think government and uh, the public uh, sector institution uh, uh, can do to drive sh uh, change? And what do you see uh, regarding the private sector as well? I mean, you just mentioned it. Or there's some specificities uh, that we need to be uh, uh, aware of so that the, the participants uh, understand what uh, they can, uh, the quick wins they can implement. One thing that I think is crucial is that the magnitude and the complexity of this uh, crisis makes the public sector role absolutely fundamental. And uh, But that said, this is a productive sector and as such, it really requires uh, from businesses and the private sector. So we really need uh, tourism specific and differentiated strategies that are led by the public sector, but in very close coordination as well with the private sector. Uh, and uh, it will require as well highly specialized and professional support for the design and implementation of this solution. So ways to collaborate, I think most of the, the countries, uh, I will not say all because all is a very big statement, but I think in all the countries I'm working, they have created partnerships with the uh, private sector that in most cases in the tourism sector, you have already some type of um, coordination between, you know, the, the the private sector and the public sector. But nowadays it has been even more fundamental and I think it has a strength. In terms of uh, what I would suggest uh, for, for everyone who is participating in this hackathon, I think it's very, very important to really identify the problem you are want, wanting to solve, dimension it. So really be very precise about what type of issue you want to solve. Identify what are the root cause analysis for that problem and what are the determinants that might condition the solution that you might try to implement. And then have very specific, um, you know, solutions that are attacking those root causes that are creating that problem. And I think that applies not only for the demand, but as well the supply. And uh, I think it will be uh, very important to have this. this is, it seems very obvious, but sometimes when we are trying to develop, I mean, having really been the key question here is uh, our theory of change and what will be the question zero what is the variable of interest that we are trying to change what what do we want to change and i think that will apply uh, for any solution that we are trying to, to bring perfect uh do you have a, uh, so that's the, the recommendation do you have examples of solutions which are uh, currently being done uh, and making a specific uh, difference, like uh, tangible, uh, tangible solutions which are making a specific difference and which are currently uh, implemented in, sp in some countries that you are saying, just to give uh, an understanding of uh, what is being done, for example, in uh, El Salvador or in other countries uh, where you see uh, opportunity. So what we see here is that we have different solutions for the, we have to three clear uh, phases from uh, the crisis, no? The first one will be the survival, the restart, and the repositioning. And uh, I think in all of them, uh, we have some solutions that are, they were important before, but uh, this crisis has magnified them. The first solution is that we are seeing now uh, that this common problem, uh, many uh, data and market intelligence providers are, sh are sharing some insights. And these type of insights, for example, or this technological driven solutions in order to analyze the demand, how the demand is behaving, how the lead times are changing, how the different market segments are uh, evolving in terms of, uh, you know, their, their willingness to travel is going to be fundamental for the destinations in order to be very precise about their marketing campaigns. And when I say destinations, I say the public sector, but as well the private sector. So. In order to have, we are, we are in, a, in an environment that we have not talked about the fiscal magnitude and uh, as well of this crisis, but this is, we have to face a very important challenge when both the private sector and the public sector have less resources. So it makes it always, as always, much more complicated. So I think some of the solutions will be precisely trying to have a better understanding of, of uh, you know, uh, our demand, our demand prospects and uh, the different segments. We have seen a lot of travel sentiment analysis that is very interesting, but as well and precisely in terms of how reservations are looking up, how are catching up, what are the book flights and search that we are seeing, how are they behaving, are they really starting the moment that the, that destination is opening, or is there any uh, lead time that we will have to wait for X months until we are reassuring. And anything that really uh, help us in terms of uh, planning and be able to, to help with um, 
with uh, how to manage no this 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 uh, this crisis in terms of for example the um, the bio protocols many solutions tablet solutions traceability solutions for the contagions and things like that i think uh, are are very important i have a question and uh, we might want to uh, to uh, to do a fi some final words afterwards uh, do you know what is the impact regarding corporate travel for example so what we have seen, and there has been a lot of debate on that, it was that first uh, companies were even, uh, corporate travel was the first one uh, in, in some uh, markets that stopped uh, in the sense because the, uh, independently of the government's policies, some companies were uh, reacting even earlier than those uh, governments. So, uh, and there is uh, what we have seen in some travel sentiment analysis is that there is, less the less risk perceived from those travelers because they are used to travel a lot so the perception of risk is not as high as in the leisure markets but their willingness to uh, restart traveling is is uh, lower uh, that said uh, i mean most analysis i have uh, seen say that it probably will be uh, one of the first segments but there is a lot of debate as well and how this will be impacted by all the new trend that we have about telework and uh, this uh, new teleconference, etc. Another segment that could be a neat segment is, uh, for example, the nomads. Like you now have, for example, in the United States, uh, that is a very, for example, very important outbound market from the Latin American Caribbean region where I work. They have used to have 25% of people who regularly, more or less regularly telework. How is this going to affect this crisis? It's going to probably increase that number. And what we are seeing is that there are some segments, uh, uh, especially millennials, are thinking of maybe teleworking from different places. And that uh, will be tourism too, uh, according to how long they probably uh, stay. So that would require specific solutions. Uh, one thing that it has been uh, said that is gonna be very much affected is uh, big conventions, big events, anything that is related to a lot of people uh, gathering, a lot of people, will probably take longer to recover. And they are from the, the supply side in terms of businesses, they are thinking of new ways to mitigate that demand drop. Like for example, instead of having these big events, uh, they are providing solutions for uh, those that are maybe transitioning to a longer period of teleworking or those that do not want to have those meetings in their uh, business locations to have a small gatherings that they are able to facilitate with business centers and they are recommending. And this is something that I have seen in several Latin American countries, notably, for example, in Panama, that we were talking the other day with some uh, hoteliers. Perfect. Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, really appreciate your insight. I hope it gave uh, uh, some uh, good indications to the different participants uh, and also all the other people uh, looking at the, the live stream uh, regarding the numbers, the scope, the impact and uh, the different uh, steps in the recovery and uh, the, the rapidity or at least the, the timing, the, ti the deadline, the, the timeline of the recovery. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining and, uh, and see you soon. Thank you. See you soon, Florian. Thank you very much to you and the, the team. It has been a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. So, now we have uh, a small break, if I'm not mistaken. Aurélie, do you want to jump into the... Oui. <laughs> oui. Thank you, Olga. Bye-bye. Thank you, Olga. Hop là, I'm not hearing you guys. So we do a small break, that's it? Yes. We have a small break. Uh, we suggest uh, we have a 15 minute break. And during the break, we're going to display some nice comments that you guys uh, have left in the chat. And after the break, we're going to kick off the panel number two that is going to be moderated by Jean. Yes. So Jean, do you want to tease what, what to expect after Olga's presentation on industry overview? Well, I, I think we dovetail right into it at the perspective of, of a research uh, analyst position from a bank gives us sort of a macroeconomic and 
and consumer macro view. Uh, by consumer, I mean uh, traveler, all travelers, and and the dynamics of the industry. Here we have subsets in consumer experts in Peter, business in Susan, which is the coal face of travel supply and travel consumption by corporates. And then uh, uh, Stefan, who's got air transport in, in the primary focus, but transport also as an issue linking consumer and, bu and, and business. So I think we're gonna easily fill 30 minutes because I, I think I copied you guys on, on the email that I sent to them yesterday. I want them to do a one or two minute overview and I'll pick from what they say and bounce those ideas around the three of them. Great. Uh, my my one we... question before we come back is I think we're gonna I'll try to end five or six minutes before the end of the hour and I'll keep my eye on the, on the clock. You just tease me in the private chat if you get questions. We can okay. interrupt the conversation at any time if the question seems like it's compelling within the context that we're talking about, or we can just, I'll make a call in the beginning for people to be actively questioning. And we, we are live actually right now. So people are listening to us. So we That's can, we, so um, keep engaging because we can see your comments coming and we want that second panel to be very, um, you know, uh, engaging and participative. So we are going to monitor your questions. Um, and for now, uh, maybe time to have a coffee or uh, maybe uh, wine, depending where you are in the world. And um, we just have a very uh, nice and plain uh, break slides. In the meantime, we're going to display the different nice comments you sent to us. And we will be back in 15 minutes. And, uh, stay safe. <laughs> stay safe.
Hello. Hello. You're him. So we're, we're live, huh, Jean, again. Yes, we are. So, but apparently, people are dropping, so we need to uh, to give uh, to give some insights, which is fine, which I'm happy to do. So currently, uh, Papa. Hello. Let me check. Okay. On Go ahead. Welcome back, everyone. I'm I'm dropping I'm jumping in, Florian Jean. May, maybe uh, while we are waiting to kick off the second panel, maybe we can share some numbers. Um, yep. Like how many how many participants do we have so far who have registered to the hack? So I'm uh, currently checking on the Dev Post site because this morning we had uh, much more than 300, and we are at 410 participants almost. Great. So, and so, guys, you uh, still have uh, quite some hours to uh, to uh, find a team uh, or find someone joining your project or idea and register uh, uh, register on Dev Post and register your your challenge or your ID and register your team members as well. So uh, it's still uh, it's still possible. And for this, you need to go on Slack, uh, where there's a lot of uh, buzz currently uh, within the different channels per region, uh, asking for uh, team members. And uh, there is a lot of uh, matchmaking happening. So uh, don't hesitate. Right. If you go on Slack, make sure that if you present yourself saying, I'm looking for a team or this is my project, Please specify quickly your two or three uh, key uh, uh, skills or competences, so that people can contact you much easy, uh, much uh, much easier uh, by uh, by doing some uh, keyword search. That will give you a much uh, much easier way of uh, joining a team or finding people willing to uh, to join you. So what what has been great to see so far is that. Um, we have teams working on, on both sides of travel, I would say. We've seen already some ideas submitted related to leisure travel, others related to business travel, and uh, even other ideas covering both. So uh, I, I guess this is a, this is a good uh, um, introduction to the panel number two uh, that Jean is going to moderate. So I'm going to step out uh, and Jean, the floor is yours. I will let you introduce. I'm stepping out. I'm stepping yes, out. Yes, as well. Florian, we need to step out. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, while you're bringing our guests on, let me just give you a, a very brief commentary that, that sets them up very well. It was so good to have a global banker in development uh, in Olga Gomez sort of set the stage for this next panel. Uh, I was really struck by her summary slide where it talked about the industry needing to first survive, second restart, and third reposition. I would say companies are solving for X with that being a simultaneous equation. Many companies are balancing furloughs, bringing people back, deciding whether this is a good time to be in product development. Can they get product done quickly for when the market's beginning to come back? You don't have any of those problems in this hackathon. You only have four days to perform, and that's a good thing. But know that the more likely your ideas that you're working on are implementable in some way within an existing strategy a company has, or in some new way that they hadn't thought about, the more likely is they will get traction in the marketplace more quickly coming out of this pandemic. So that should be inspiring you to be collaborative and, and competitive at the same time with your ideas and, and with your colleague mentors as they help you navigate this. So with that said, um, I'm ready to go if you are already and we can bring live uh, our panelists. Welcome, Mary Travel. Hello. Good morning. Well, if I may, um, we're pleased to be joined uh, by uh, three experts in three fields that all of you are thinking about and some of you may be focusing on, we hope. Um, if I may go around the clock here, please welcome uh, Susan Lichtenstein, who's uh, a managing partner at Digitravel. 
uh, and she has the uh, honor and privilege of being a shuttle diplomat between travel suppliers and travel consumers at businesses, conferences, and meetings. She can tell us how joyful it is to be in some of those engagements and how uplifting it was before the business of business travel shut down. We're also joined uh, on the clock by Peter Syme, who is one of the world's uh, longest and leading experts in the tours and activity sector, two ways, by being an advisor after many years of that experience, and um, also by being a tour operator in adventure travel and destination travel for a clientele that is fortunate enough to have him as a guide of, of, uh, of their journeys. And last but not least, someone who can knit together leisure travel that Peter represents and business travel that Susan represents. We're honored to have Stephen Copart from IATA, who wears several hats in innovation and development, but is here to represent not only air travel, but the connective tissue of all travel. And that is how we get there and how we get home in all forms of multimodal transport. Uh, this is not a presentation-laden conversation. It is a roundtable conversation because we felt this is what we were all missing by being in a conference hall of our choice and seeing people on stage that we both wanted to be in our minds and hearts, but were also eager to hear in person. Um, we regret not being able to do that in person with all of you other than through the magic of our StreamYard uh, uh, device. Um, but what I'd like to do is throw it open to about a one to two minute statement by each of our guests in the same order I introduced them to tell you a little more about what they do and why they do it and leave us with one or two points that they would like to explore further in a roundtable conversation. And before I do that, let me say to all the members of the audience, uh, you are more than welcome to lob questions uh, into the comment section and uh, Arlie and Katie behind the scenes will help me navigate those for later on in the session and we'll try to get as many of them answered online here as possible. Anyway, well, welcome, Susan, and the floor is yours for a minute or so. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this great opportunity. I'm incredibly excited to be part of this. Um, so I am a managing partner of Digi Travel Consulting, and our main focus is to work with companies and do an assessment really like you never had a travel program before. Take a look at what's happening today, and then help, hopefully we can flatten those processes, automate a bunch of those processes together, and then allow new technologies, uh, technologies today, new booking methodologies, booking methodologies today to work together. And I think this is just great timing because the opportunity today to rebuild programs has never been better because nobody's traveling. So it really is a great opportunity to kind of advance travel programs. The most exciting thing I'm doing right now, though, is the TAMS Committee, Travel and Meeting Standards Committee. Uh, similar to the speaker we heard earlier, I was pacing my office and it's not that big, so a lot of pacing and asking somebody needs to build standards that both buyers and suppliers agree to. And then I said, why don't I try that? So we put together a task force of both buyers, suppliers, consultants, no walls, no stripes, no titles, and got together. And we have over eight subcommittees now, over 175 people actively involved. We have 10,000 viewers in and out, um, and we'll be publishing in a couple of weeks from now. But to have the two teams working together to create recommended standards has been amazing. So thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Susan. So Peter, would you like to uh, introduce what your thoughts are? Yeah, hello there and welcome everyone who's listening in. Uh, my name's Peter and at heart, I'm a tour operator myself with an inbound tour operation in Scotland and Morocco and I also have an outbound expedition business that goes all around the world. So at heart, my real drive is the experience of the customer first, foremost and always. And leading on for that, we're in a period due to COVID, as we all know, that one of the overriding things is confidence. The confidence of winning that customer back in as quick a time as we can. And that 
that theme of confidence runs across the whole travel industry, whether you're a hotel, whether you're an airline, whether you're an airport, whether you're a taxi driver, or whether you're a tour operator like me, it's confidence across all of our systems past and new systems coming forward that is going to be the thing that gets the, the industry back on its feet in the first phase and then allows it to rebuild. If we lose the customer's confidence and we have damaged the customer's confidence so far, there is no doubt about that. If we lose it, <clears throat> the rebuilding phase will be much harder. So confidence is a theme that I'm looking to expand on during this uh, conversation. Thanks, Peter. We'll keep that in mind in our line of questioning here. Uh, Stefan, to you. Hi, um, thank you, Jean. Um, thank you all and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you come from. Um, my name is Stefan Kopart and I'm um, with Ayala, as Jean said. I'm running our um, innovation department and our program management office uh, for one of our uh, divisions. Um, and um, I find this um, this opportunity like really exciting, and I'm super uh, super happy to be part of it. Um, IATA doesn't necessarily resonate with innovation and speed, but I can tell you that uh, uh, this is something that uh, we are experiencing um, uh, as we speak. And uh, the point I wanted to um, to emphasize here today is um, um, the need for speed and the need for alignment and collaboration. I mean. Um, Restoring confidence, as Peter just said, uh, bringing standards and, and technology together, as Susan explained earlier on, uh, this can only happen if we go all together in one direction. And there is a, a huge opportunity, I believe, um, that we can uh, we can take on board here is to bring um, innovation to remove the complexity this industry as a whole had um, and accelerate all the transformational activities uh, that we've been dreaming of. Uh, for the past decade and uh, that have been like uh, slowly implemented so far but we can only do that in a coordinated way and uh, we can only do this in a very pragmatic way and i think that um, this hackathon and giving the opportunities for um, all those developers and, and innovators to bring um, uh, new solutions and i think that was gene who said that earlier on that are uh, implementable and that's uh, part of my role in IATA, we don't do innovation for the sake of innovation, but we try to connect um, the startups, the developers, the innovators, um, and bring them the capability they need so that they can have their solution integrated and implemented within the airline ecosystem and the air transport ecosystem as a whole as quickly as possible. And I think this is the right time to do that. Great. All right, if I may, um, I want to seize on two key words that that uh, each of you mentioned, actually three that each of you mentioned. One is experiences, the other is alignment, and the other is confidence. So from a business travel standpoint, Susan, you kick it off. You mentioned you've been working in the TAMS group to um, restore, restart, reimagine what meaning the meetings business looks like, convention meeting look like, what corporate travel looks like. It, thinking of the words um, alignment experiences and new words, like the duty of care that every corporate buyer has for someone on whose behalf they're managing their journey from the home office and duty of care that the, the event provider has to provide a sanitized and clean and, and comfortable and confident experience. Can you give us a little more detail about what experiences will look like between the tension of remote work and physical uh, travel and meeting work? Uh, coming out of that TAMS set of standards? Yes, yeah, so um, the standards, obviously, because of the situation that we're in today, um, you know, it's great for a lot of information was coming out the corporate world, right? A lot of companies were getting a ton of information. I mean, I had you guys did a great job as well. Um, but, you know, what we felt was really a gap, what was missing was what were the companies saying? What were the travelers saying? And how do we match those together? Um, so put duty or care first, obviously, without duty, care, health, hygiene, nothing else really matters. And then how do we um, 
create standards that are good for now, six months from now, you know, and on and on and on. So that became a very big project and very successful. Um, we're, we're happy to say that we'll have that publication coming out in a couple of weeks. But more importantly to your question, I don't think it could have been done if we separated. It just would have been more of the same. And I think you mentioned that earlier, Stephen. Um, the things that we do notice, you know, people ask me all the time, hey, when is travel coming back the way it was in 2019? And I tell them, from my opinion, never. Because people are very comfortable now using video. And I think travel will come back in phases all the way through to the end of 2022. That will be addressed in the standards of what makes sense and what doesn't. We've heard from many companies about what travel will be allowed first. Um, and I think because people are comfortable on video, you know, we'll come back to perhaps 75, 80% of 2019 over the next three to four years. Um, because we do have a new way that we can meet and greet and talk to each other, which is so great because the touch points have been awesome. So I th think you'll see some of that in the standards of well of what makes sense to go online and continue and what makes sense to do on those face-to-face -face meetings. Thank you for that. I'd, I'd like to go to Peter next. Um, what Susan said brings up uh, elements of virtual reality, augmented reality, doing what we're doing right now, having a virtual hackathon and a virtual conference. Sure. I run 37 of these things. In, live in the beer and pizza and the lack of sleep was all evident to us at once uh, in the past. If we bring this to leisure travel, where the individual confidence of the of the traveler and perhaps their ability to um, take gentle steps back into leisure travel in their lives that may be different than on behalf of others in business travel, can you expound a little bit on or expand a little bit on uh, the difference between the travel markets that you're involved in with destination and um, uh, uh, what I would call adventure travel, expedition travel. Yeah, that, I mean, it's a big market. Tours and activities and expeditions travel, it's a big market. It's 254 billion uh, as of 219, 2019 figures. And it's incredibly fragmented. There's over a million operators operating in that market. The vast majority of them are small mom and pop shop businesses. So it's an incredibly diverse and fragmented market. And as customers re-enter that market, you've got different types re-entering that market, uh, different segments of customers. You've got people at later stages of life, retirees who are very focused on cruise type markets. You've got young adventurous people who are looking for more action oriented markets and you've got historical customers coming in looking for city breaks so it's a very fragmented market but running through it all is the confidence of how do they back get back in and some will come back in quicker others will come back in slower and it's it's a complex setup of it's not just covid it's about the safety although that's been bad as it is, and that will be addressed by most of the market as best we can. There's the economic impacts that's hurt each of these sectors. How much, at the end of the day, any experience or any travel experience is a combination of three things. It's time, money, and the experience. Now, what we've had with COVID is impacted on all three of them. It's impacted on people's time. Some people have got more time. Some people are going to have less time. A lot of people are going to have a, less, a lot less money because of the impact on the economy. And the act, actual experience of travel in every sector of travel is going to be different for a prolonged period of time. And I have no idea how long that period of time is. So the whole experience involving time, money, and the actual travel has changed. And that will impact on the confidence of every single traveler, either more or less. Now, my core traveler group of my own business, they're fairly resilient because they're adventure travelers. They're used to traveling to difficult places, doing difficult things. So the virus isn't necessarily a negative, big negative to them. It's a negative. It's not a big negative. But the things that go around it is a big negative. Getting in and out of an airport, getting on a plane in a, a reasonable manner, in a reasonable time frame, getting to a destination and not going into quarantine, getting back from that destination uh, and not going into quarantine, and all of that at a price they can afford seems to be, from my feedback, much more relevant to the customer than the actual threat of COVID. 
because my customers tend to be in that 20 to 50 age group. They're not in the core endangered group. So this being a complex market, exceedingly fragmented, means that anybody who's addressing this really, really, really needs to focus on who their customer is and how is this impacting on their customer because it's impacting on different segments of the market differently. That, that last couple of sentences from Peter is very important to our hackers. Remember, implementable. Something that the consumer wants or the business traveler wants that you can deliver through your ideation exercise of design or coding uh, should, should be what you keep top of mind. Stefan, I, I want to bring you into the, to, to be a bit of a bridge here between where Susan's coming from and where Peter just did. And, and that's around uh, the NDC standards that have been guiding a lot of the innovation that IATA has been looking at. Basically, to explain to a lot of people who are hacking who may not be as familiar with the march towards standardization of how you provide one order uh, for, for a, a consumer and how you can integrate, integrate re ancillary or retailing uh, opportunities beyond the core ticketing and delivery of the customer in his or her bag. Um, I know you're focused on retailing uh, airlines as retailers uh, of many different things, many different experiences beyond the flight. What's put a, a gate on that of sorts is the pandemic itself. People's first step off their doorstep is going to be into a mode of transportation that inevitably takes them to a train or a bus or an airplane. Can you talk a little bit about some of the innovations that you guys have been implementing around NDC that, it, that maybe have changed because of the pandemic? Um, it, it's, well, I, I don't have any particular example to say, well, there is a particular technology that is implemented. What I can tell you is that um, I saw there was a question whether uh, the audience was thinking that NDC could be accelerated uh, because of this crisis. And um, I can tell you that the, the, the sentiment we have uh, in IATA, but also uh, being the voice of our um, airline members and the various partners that we are working with, the answer is yes. Um, because the, the whole retailing suite uh, vision that we, we have around NDC, around one order, around um, dynamic offer creation, um, is about bringing the, the, the flexibility and offering this capability for airlines, but also retailers, um, to offer those ancillary services you were asking. And I think um, the world of tomorrow, in terms of products, uh, will be totally, totally different. And um, uh, in our distribution efforts, in our retailing efforts today, we are engaging heavily uh, with the business travel community, with um, the corporate buyers community, to try and understand what will be the demand and what will be the new products, and therefore what will be um, the new standards or the evolution of the standards that we need to uh, um, to work on to facilitate those new products and offers to be distributed in the, in the, the most efficient way and in the, the, the fastest possible way um, as well. So um, indeed, uh, NDC will certainly, and uh, I don't want to limit the whole retailing and the whole effort around NDC, it's like, um, we're moving into the world of orders and offers, and uh, and this will certainly uh, be accelerated and be an opportunity for that. And I, it's um, it's about um, uh, the distribution side, but it's also about. Uh, I just want to um, uh, jump on on what Peter was saying as well on the confidence aspect, and I think that uh, and and the role of the the. the travel agents, they, this population, all the intermediaries, all the actors in, in this world um, will have to get access to consistent information about what's happening out there. And it's uh, it's completely fragmented today. We have very difficulty understanding what are the border regulations, what are the, uh, the sanitization regulations. Um, IATA and ICAO have put together some recommendations there, but there is um, four our committee of hackers an opportunity of uh, solutions to be brought on how to bring that information to the consumer and to the travel trade so that we have a, a consistent and we can bring comp and consistency in the expectation as well for people to go back to travel. Great. 
So I, I wanted to ask a little bit about this uh, distribution question from the business travel perspective. Um, if I were a hacker in the hackathon, and all of you hackers can take this as personal advice, uh, not a prediction of the future, um, I would keep in mind that with every year that passes with or out, without a pandemic, the API economy will insinuate itself in ways that are logarithmic and we can't really predict. Uh, previously, we had a, a big disconnect between the experience that someone was providing you at the end of your uh, initial uh, arrival and all of the money that changed hands to distribute that experience with touch points. Uh, some years ago, I saw a travel consultant I hold dear say 20 cents of every dollar spent on travel is for laying on a beach or skiing on a mountain. 80% is someone with their finger in your pie, therefore your cost as a, as a traveler. So can you talk a little bit about open APIs, about open infrastructures, corporate travel departments, while with duty of care, being different kinds of travel agents with direct connections that maybe they didn't have five, 10 years ago? A little bit about that distribution. And I'm gonna to come to Peter next on this as an operator. Yeah, thank you. Well, first I want to say, Peter, I'm calling you after this to get in one of those uh, tours of yours. So, um, yes, this is my song, right? So I always like to say that I was somebody who didn't agree with those different booking mechanisms or distributions when I was managing a huge travel program, thought it all had to be in this box, thought I had to control every second of it, and realized quickly I wasn't controlling anything. I wasn't managing anything. And I think this virus really shows that. And it shows that it's really about the behavior and the experiences of the traveler. And if we give them the right experience, they'll behave the right way. And 99% of the company travelers do the right thing every time, whether they're going through a tool or an agency or direct. So I think it's critical that companies at this time take advantage of having three distribution models, right? No more big boxes, right? If you need an agent, use one. If you need a tool, use one. If you want to go direct, that's okay. This is 2020. Data can flow freely between your system directly, by the way, and you can get it on demand, and the system of whatever technology you use. You are the company. You are the buyer. You should be able to use whatever suits you at the time that you need it. We are going to have a ton of information coming at us now. We're going to have hotels posting on their sites who's – whose rate, cleaning ratings are coming out and who's who's going to be you know, cleaning their rooms every hour and who, which planes are taking which time to make connections and how safe and who can we trust and what confidence can we give? Because companies can <clears throat> save travelers, but they're going to do their best to protect their travelers. And if that information is going to live directly on a site, then, then we should be able to book there. If that information is going to live on a tool, then that's cool. If that information is going to live on an agent, that's cool too but you shouldn't limit yourself. This is the time, this time that we're living in right now, we have to enable kind of a company marketplace that and a global profile, I'm obsessed with that, that allows a traveler to book where they need and get that information immediately back to that travel leader, back to that company, back to that finance team, as it's happening, as they book, so that you are in complete control of what's going on in your company. But other than that, I have zero personal opinion about this. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. I hope the hackers are understanding that there are lots of opportunities to provide those three ecosystems with plenty of interesting elements and product and B2B opportunities. But uh, Peter, I did, I did want you to put on your tour operator hat and talk to the hackers a little bit about this thing of distribution. How has not only the pandemic, but the march of time into the API economy and what will come and what will come when everything resets? How does that affect demand generation, lead generation, um, the way you, you get yourself out there for both expedition and destination travel? And, and what advice could you give these hackers about solutions that you could use better that they could build? Yeah. Well, the, the hackers need to understand tours and activities from a distribution perspective, is a long way behind airline ticketing and hotels and accommodation. We are, we're a big chunk of the travel industry, but we're not anywhere near as connected as the rest of the travel industry. Now, why is that? 
Well, a steel tube is a steel tube is a steel tube that flies and it has seats and it's a yield model and it has a different brand on it, but it's the same product that's gone from A to B. A hotel room will have a different name on the door, but it's a bed. These are more or less commodities, especially an airline. An airline is a commodity nowadays. 50 years ago, it may be an experience, but today it's a commodity. A bedroom is a commodity. And you can more or less standardize these from a technology perspective and a distribution perspective and a product perspective. When you have over a million tours and activity operators all providing very different services on the ground in a very different way, it's proved to be incredibly difficult to standardize in a way that makes distribution easy. Now, that's not to say distribution in this sector doesn't happen because it does. We have massive distribution. And in this and in this climate, we need more distribution, much more distribution, because the average operator does not have a good distribution network in tours and activities. They'll sell some product via TripAdvisor, they'll sell some via Viator, sell some from Booking, some Expedia, maybe some Get Your Guide, and then some from travel agents. But if you survey tour operators of how many distribution partners they have, the vast majority have less than 10. So they do a lot direct and they do a lot in destination, local, still offline. This sector is still driven offline rather than online. Only around 20% of the market of operators and tours and activities have a system that is able to connect an API to the market to actually distribute in the first place. Right? Many will do it manually by doing it uploads. So this is a sector that's behind, which means there's the opportunity uh, for, the, for the audience to make a difference here with distribution because the operators understand enough about it now that they know they need more distribution, so they want it. Coming out of COVID, they want it more than ever because it's like, if we are right as we come out of this, the volume will be down for everybody, so every customer becomes a prisoner, and those that can get the distribution out there the widest, the better it is. Now, some challenges with that, over the last couple of years when we have built distribution, it's got a bit out of control. Because if, if we take this example, if you've moved into a Marriott hotel and you check in and the Marriott has managed to get an app on you and you look at your app to do an experience the next day, it will go through a meta search that's then pulling the experience from TripAdvisor, then pulling it from a reservation system that eventually pulls it from the tour operator. That's four or five levels that all need paid for. And who pays for it? The tour operator pays for it initially and eventually the customer ends up paying for it as well. So there's a simplification here needs to be applied. So customer, technology, so supplier needs to be much more connected in a simple way that brings value, not just extracts value. So the, the two main issues is there isn't enough distribution anywhere near enough distribution in this industry, but the distribution needs to be simplified as well. Oh, <laughs> So uh, uh, we, we, we have a little less than 10 minutes left, and I would encourage hackers, mentors, or anyone else in the audience to send your questions through. We'll try to get to them. But in the meantime, I want to introduce a content question here. Uh, one of the terms of art that we've heard a lot about in 2018 and 19, leading up to the unfortunate pandemic, is the term leisure a combination of business and leisure travel. Now that we have an opportunity to think about resetting how we perform the advisory service to consumers or perform the advisory service within our own walls or as a travel management company, as an agency or companies within their own walls, how does the blending of what's happening today, remote work and actual physical uh, presence uh, reflect a potential opportunity here for new thinking about combining business and leisure travel. How are digital nomadic business travelers going to be increasingly not in a vertical office or a horizontal complex, but in the comfort of their own home office and entertaining themselves with something that looks an awful like consumer travel when they do have to make a business trip? And I'd like to start just so our two 
content related folks here can think about it. I'd like to start with Stefan on that and then move to Susan. So be con give me a, you know one or two minutes on this topic, please. That's a very, um, it, it, it's a very interesting topic. Um, and um, I think it's, um, if I wear my I had a hat, it, it's, um, it's something that we will need to look into and see how we can uh, uh, work that 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 question out uh, from what we do. If I uh, remove my head, I had, I believe that it's uh, it's something that we've looked at in our think tanks, for instance, at some point, saying, well, as Susan was saying, um, the world of travel will be completely different tomorrow. Uh, video will be embedded in in the habits of everyone. Um, so business travel will be more Zoom travel or uh, Teams travel or, or uh, uh, stream yard travel or what else and um, and bringing leisure into it uh, is uh, is a complex thing because it's like uh, uh, it's like virtual and I think that links to some of uh, one of the initiatives that um, uh, we are driving as part of our restart plan and Ayada we, we are putting together uh, a restart plan for the industry that constitutes um, 16 buckets on, on, on four main areas. And one is about stimulating the demand. And one of the area that uh, stimulating the demand bucket is uh, marketing destination. And uh, we'll need the whole industry to come together to attract people to the destination. And I think um, there might be forces joined here to bring all that together and uh, offer those uh, uh, virtual tours uh, in those video conferencing thing or on gamification. We talked a lot about that. That can happen uh, aside those uh, those business meetings that we have. Um, uh, I think it's certainly something to explore. I don't have the answer and probably Susan and Peter will be more uh, precise than me on, on their thoughts and because they, they have the demand from the people. Um, but that, that, that would be my thoughts. Okay. Well, that's great. Susan, can you just give me a little bit on this bleacher thing and yeah. how that fits into your model? And I do have a, a question from a, a member of the audience I want to get to. So let's be sensitive on time. Sure. So I love what Stephen, you said before, when you said, don't innovate, just innovate, right? Don't think about that. Think about, and that happens so often, right? Build it and they'll come. Well, they may not come. So why don't, you know, we have to build it from the traveler out. You know, what is their experience? And in this world that we're living in today, most of us have not traveled or are not traveling right now for many reasons, right? And so when we do hit the road, and I know we will hit the road, I can't wait myself to hit the road, I am going to take advantage of any trip I take to, to put some leisure activity into that, just because I've been in these four walls for a very long time now. So I will be doing that. So how do we do that? Again, the technology today makes that so available if we could do a digital profile where you sign in with a work email, let's say, and that drove all your work preferences one way, or you, or and then the second part, you signed in with a personal email, and that drove your preferences another way. I do that in my personal life all the time. I have many accounts in both in one company for both ways. I get my data separate ways. I hear many companies I talk to say, what about security, Susan? What if a piece of the leisure travel hits our corporate email? And I go, so what happens if that happens? That's not, it's still booked on their credit card. It's still booked on their information. So if we can get our technology partners out there to be able to parse the information the right way, drive the experience in a one-stop shopping environment, I think, and create that digital global profile and don't build just to build, boom, I think you're going to have amazing success. Thanks for that. Let's, let's grab a uh, question from the uh, and this is it, I'm assuming. Would it be hashtag business travel greener, sustainable now? Uh, would be companies try to avoid travel by plane in favor of train? Would the business trades face to face? I don't have all of the sense of that question, but does somebody want to jump on that one? I'm just going to jump in real fast. So part of the TAMS group, we have a rail committee and, rail and everybody's working together. And this question came up, right? So sustainability naturally is going to be increased. Your carbon emissions are going to be reduced by 25% because many of the meetings will stay online, like two people from the same company. So great news there. I think that'll stay. 
obviously it's big now, but the real committee, and I'm going to share the secret, they're going to kill me. The real committee, they came up with a great comparison. If you guys can build it to be able to see when you're booking, here's a plane, here's a train, make a choice. And then you have the comparison of the emissions and whatever, and you put your thresholds in. How cool would that be? And then I added, you could code it. Life is good, perfect, and everybody could see in one page what's happening. That's what our committees are coming up with. Great. Um, Peter, I want to come back to you on the on the Bleacher thing because you teed it up with such a heavy emphasis on your own Bleacher customers. Uh, can you imagine a little bit about this Bleacher question in light of a post-pandemic uh, recovery here? Yeah, there's... There's two sections there. There's the official Belizeur, which is where, which has been massive, which is where destinations, cities have big conference events, big conference halls, big conference hotels, where large groups of corporate companies or associations or networks turn up, and it can be anything from hundreds to tens of thousands. So that's the official Belizeur. They're there for work reasons. Reasons. They're there for the conference but then lots of tourism act product and tourism activities goes on around them that's been organized. And that's all been through kind of the official DMCs and the organizations. That's probably not going to happen for a reasonable period of time now, because that's one sector that's going to take the longest to come back is big groups of people inside buildings is probably going to take quite a while to return. So that was the official big chunk of that market. So what's going to come back quicker is more independent business travelers, and there was always millions of them doing it, meetings here, meetings there, flying around the world, doing independent leisure things when they're there. Now, at the moment, most of that market really isn't controlled. It's fragmented. It's offline. Someone's sitting in his hotel. I do it myself. I'm sitting in a hotel at night. I'm having my dinner. What am I going to do tomorrow? I've got two spare hours in between meetings. I'm going to go and do that tour. I'm going to go and see that experience. There is no real control on that at the moment and it's a massive massive in destination spend that no one really has a handle on no one and people try to get a little bit of it the hotels try to get a bit the dmcs try to get a little bit the corporate business come the travel companies try to get a little bit no one's really got a handle on that no no one can really actually give you the figures on how much that spend is they give you the official figures from the the corporate event type market but not the independent business traveler, which is in the millions every month. How much do they spend in destination on leisure when they're there? Got it. Okay, we're going to go to another audience question, but in transition, let me say, I've been a home office bound worker for 21 years by choice. And my digital nomadic experiences are two third places. My home is my home. My home is my office. That's the first two but I have a three and a four and there are coffee shops that are five miles from my office and 10 miles from my office. The better coffee and quieter shop is 10 miles away. So when I need to write, that's the one I go to. When I need to be in a meeting in a buzzy environment, the five mile variety I go to. That's my version of third place, which is a version of day to day leisure living. So can I have from the team, can I have a, uh, uh, the question that we can ask the audience, and I think this will be our last question. What's your perspective on self-serve and touchless platforms to promote more secure and contactless travel? I'd like to start with Stephen, then go to Peter, and go to Susan for your pen, your ultimate responses here. Um, sure. Well, I personally believe this will be the new normal. Um, and um, the, the processes that we've tried to change at airport for the past 20 years, like introducing biometrics and, and uh, uh, all these kind of things, that will be implemented in, in the questions of months now. And um, uh, contactless travel is like, um, it's going to be a prerequisite to future travel. Um, we we we'll have to um, to implement that, and we are doing it as we speak. There is, uh, you know, the the, the CART initiatives driven by ICAO with the support of IATA and ACI, the Airport uh, Council um, Association as well, and there have been like a set of measures 
um, uh, proposed in terms of uh, um, uh, biosanity on on the um, on the ground. Um, in um, in our teams of thematic, for instance, we are also working on the on this concept of contactless travel and uh, really putting into life. The concept of one ID, which is bringing uh, uh, matching the digital identity with the physical identity in a verified way, um, so that the customer, the passenger, will be uh, holding their data, and they will be the one in control to provide that data to whoever organization it is. So that will be either the government, the airlines, or the airport. And um, uh, this will be um, as an app, uh, but this will be also released as an SDK ultimately because uh, I remember in my own world, um, those facilitation processes like kiosk or even uh, web checking app or mobile app uh, was always seen by the various operators as a, as a marketing tool. So, well, this is my brand, I wanna have it. And then a few years later, it became something that everybody wanted to have and uh, uh, nobody cared about the, uh, the marketing, everybody was caring about the efficiency and how, um, how it was um, uh, widely implemented as a customer who has decided what they want. And that's the same thing here. So there will be those uh, uh, biometrics solutions in place. Uh, it's not gonna be exactly the same everywhere. I think we'll have, and we're working on standards that could be applied uh, in the various countries because some countries will favor facial recognition, some other will be other technologies, but the, um, the, the back end and the processes and the core should be, should be consistent across the board. So uh, yeah, the answer is, uh, is, is absolutely yes. Thank you, Thiago. Or, uh, Thiago. He's he's uh, promoting his uh, his hack here. So if any of you guys are judges, you know, be careful. You're being lobbied. It's all right. Uh, <clears throat> charity begins at home. Peter, um, in your two lines of business, uh, uh, expedition and destination, maybe the contactless travel theme applies a little bit more to the destination uh, because we're not in the wild on a wild on a river or on a hike or on a scale. Um, so sure. over to you on this uh, this idea of contactless travel and where it touches leisure. Yeah. You. For the audience, they, they have to think everybody in travel, doesn't matter what sector in travel, my sectors or other side, you have the same friend and you have the same enemy. And that friend and enemy is this. It's the mobile phone. Again, it is the smartphone. Now, every single thing that is either a commodity, a product, or a service. There's five, there's five sectors of the economy. There's commodities, there's products, or services, there's experiences, and there's transformational experiences. If you're in the service, product, or commodity business, which a lot of the travel is, you have to be contactless going forward. It actually seems quite crazy sitting here today that we have already not made lots of this stuff contact. We're still turning up in hotels and being handed keys. And um, we're still having to go into taxis and find a card or find some cash to pay for them. It actually, looking back, seems a bit crazy. So everything is going contactless if it's an efficiency gainer. If you're in the efficiency game, you're going contacts. If you don't, you're going to get destroyed by other people that does. Once you get out of commodities, products and services and move into the experience market and the transformational market where I hang out, it's not so straightforward. People are either, in these first three, it's about saving time. Remember, what is travel? It's a combination of travel, money, and experience. When I'm getting to the airport, getting on the taxi, getting off, getting to the other end, it's all about saving time in the most efficient way, contactlessly. When people arrive at my door, they're not really looking to save time. They're looking to spend time well. So it's how about they're going to spend their time going down that river trip, climbing that mountain. The contactless efficiency doesn't impact as much at my end. It will have an impact, and the mobile phone certainly has an impact because it is a disruptor that we've never seen before. But the main part I see contactless is in the first three sectors of the economy. Commodities, products, and services, you have to be contactless, you have to be seamless, and it has to flow. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for showing us the obvious. We should have been doing this yesterday. Susan, you have the floor last. So, yes, I mean, Peter uh, and Steve, so true, right? This should have been happening a long time ago. Um, the technology's been there in finance and other markets and retail. 
I mean, I know my bank sent out a notice to everybody saying, if you don't have a chip card so you could tap and go, you're getting one, whether you want to or not. I mean, it's just been, you're right. It's, it's all on my mobile phone. So why not business travel? Commercial, I think leisure travel is way ahead of us here, but business travel has to be touchless. It just does. People don't want to spend time in a line. People want to spend quality time, no matter where they are, even if at the airport, if you can catch a meeting, if you can jump on a call, if you can be where you need to be to board that plane sooner, faster, safer, why not? So if I get to a hotel, walk to my room, use my smartphone, enter that room, why not? That is all available right now. It needs to get tighter. It needs to get simpler. If I, if I negotiate something, why do I have to look to see if you gave me what I negotiated? Whether it's a discount or whether it's a static rate, all of this has to be touchless. All of this has to be automated and all of this has to be real time on demand, ready to take any change from any outside place at any time. Okay. Um, it's time to summarize. I'm going to give each of you uh, sort of a, a, a 30 second free pass here to make one prediction that hasn't been made uh, on this uh, panel discussion here in either your own personal travel, in your clients experiences or in your business. So let's start in reverse order here. Susan, you've got 30 seconds to predict the future a little bit. Um, I predict that um, we're going to see a very fast ramp up into direct digital connections due to the need to get the content from duty of care on board faster. <clears throat> Peter. I come from a background of guided experiences, whether it's human to human conduct uh, contact. That is going to continue, but I also predict we're moving into a whole world of digital experiences where the customer will have an experience in destination guided by their phone. Thank you. Ste Stefan. I can only echo uh, Susan and Peter on the digital acceleration. I think my prediction as well is on the airport's uh, process. Uh, the, this contactless thing will go much faster, and like the, the facial recognition, the contactless activity will will really accelerate dramatically. In six months, I'm sure we will do more than in in the past ten years. And I um, I tend to be a bit optimistic as well. I would predict that um, the industry will recover um, a bit faster than we think it should, and the collaboration will certainly um, uh, be also. Uh, better within all the actors. I mean, all these questions of APIs and and the way to exchange information to collaborate on these digital platforms. Um, that will be certainly uh, 2021 will be the year for that. Thank you. I'd like to, to extend thanks to three individuals and one group. The three individuals are you, Susan, Peter, and Stefan for your insights, your expertise, your collegiality, and how you've been able to build a discussion here on relatively little contact with me other than a few keywords we've exchanged. And also I'd like to thank uh, our audience of hackers, mentors, judges um, for your engagement with this crowd. I really saw a few things perk up when we talked about touchless contact or payments. Uh, the innovative ideas I hope you're all working on back in your hack shops now but we can't have an event like this virtually without the excitement of, of uh, an engaged audience. So thank you for all those wonderful banners you've been sending us. And as I uh, excuse all of this from this panel, uh, I, I just want to give everyone the thanks for joining the event writ large. It's Travel Scrum of Movement to Bring Travel Back and Travel Scrum Hackathon, a contest to put your ideas and your uh, coding skills and design skills into action. So good luck, and we'll see you back here at a closing ceremony in four days. Don't sleep, just work. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you, guys. It's an uh, amazing, uh, amazing panel. Thank you for that. So uh, we had uh, we had two panels. One panel giving. Uh, global pictures and global numbers about why it's important and how it's impacting really uh, the worldwide economy and why you need to be there and try to uh, to help 
And the second panel was really insightful with a lot of great examples and great, uh, great feedback. So congratulations uh, for this panel, uh, Jean, and to, uh, uh, to Stefan, Peter, and Susan. So that's cool. Next steps. Uh, in half an hour, I'm just speaking for me. In half an hour, you'll be, uh, for some of you, if you want, I'll be uh, doing a live session as well on this YouTube channel and Facebook channel. And you'll be able to uh, ask questions uh, about teams, about uh, operations, about the hack. And I'll try to give as many, many uh, answers as possible. Uh, Saloni, it's you. Give me a OK, thanks, Florian. Thanks, Jean. It was indeed a very insightful panel. And seeing the engagement from, from our participants, the mentor, the hackers, it's very encouraging for us. I could see some of the people who have been joining our live sessions and asking us a lot of questions were also there uh, as the audience and asking questions. Hope these sessions really helped you form your ideas. And I'll just quote the panel where they said, don't innovate just to innovate. I think the industry has some real challenges right now, which we need to solve. So I hope you all can focus towards that. I'll quickly touch base on the next step so that we all know what timelines we are working towards. So everybody who joined this session and did not have an idea before this, you can still register your idea. You can still go to DevPost, get your team on DevPost, register your ideas. We'll have the submission for the ideas up until midnight UTC today. So you still have a lot of time to go. Please go ahead and submit. As soon as you do that, you join Slack, invite your team over there, form a team channel, and we'll be assigning mentors based on your idea. So whatever the idea is, we have around 80 to 90 mentors. We'll try to do the best assignment so that you can get some very valuable insights from your mentors. So after you create the team channel and you have your mentors over the next three days, you would have to set up checkpoints with your mentors so that you can take proper guidance from them. Checkpoints also act as a perfect place as milestones for you so that you can time your project and see where it is going and are you on track for submission or not. Submissions close 14 June uh, midnight UTC time. And after that is when the judging judgment process starts. Thank you so much for joining on this. We have spoken about the awards. Stay tuned for our closing ceremony and stay tuned for the amazing prizes which we have for all of you. More on Slack and you can ask a lot more questions to Florian later. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Saloni. Thanks, Thanks Jean, for, for this. Uh, you can come back. We'll do one hour live session in uh, 30 minutes time. Okay. And uh, I'll, I'll be hosting it. Uh, and uh, anyone willing to join, go ahead. Uh, guys, uh, we already love you all. Uh, as I said, welcome to the Scrum. And now it's your turn. Let's hack. And we're, go we're going to give you everything in order for you to bring it home. Thanks to everybody behind the scenes. Aurelie, Katie, you know who you are. And anyone okay. else who be propping us up for the last couple hours. Yeah, definitely already, Katie. That was amazing. Thanks a lot for that. Have a glass of wine. Bye-bye. See you in half an hour.